Okay, good morning, guys. Good morning. Um, today I want to talk to you um, about social influence. Social influence. And uh, we already touched upon it the last time a little bit. Remember, we had uh, the wisdom of the crowds, right? So that uh, crowds of people can be incredibly intelligent collectively. Uh, but their social influence came up in the context of um, the wisdom of the crowds not working out anymore, right? So today we will focus on social influence uh, and we will go into depth into two studies on social influence. One that shows how social networks, how social networks and network structures matter for social influence and the other one looking at macro level implications of social influence. Now, so these are the three things I want to talk uh, with you about today. Social influence, then we go into depth into one study. It's a, a landmark study, it's called the Medical Innovation Study. And then uh, the second one, which is it's going to be a landmark study as well, it's a relatively recent thing, it's maybe yeah, 10 years ago. Uh, it's a study on cultural markets. Okay, so let's first talk about social influence. Now, what is social influence? It's kind of something that, that you guys mm, most likely experienced um, when you start looking at these kind of things. You see it all the time. You see it all the time. You see how you change your behavior because of people around you. You see how others are doing something. You know, just the other day, I was standing at the, at the bus stop. You know, I was standing there, and then everybody was standing, and then this guy came and, uh, and, uh, and, and wanted to sit down. So he looked a little confused because everybody was standing, and the bench was empty, sort of. So the guy sat down, and then only a few seconds in, he kind of asked the question, why is everybody standing, right? And then everybody said, I don't know. I'm just standing here. I'm just waiting for the bus. But then the guy stood up as well, right? So that is actually an example of conformity. Yeah? And uh, psychologists and social psychologists did some incredible, incredible studies along these lines. Now, I had mentioned the, the ASH experiments, where people are sort of shown these different lines, you know, different lengths of it. And, uh, and then people start saying the wrong things, although they are completely uh, aware of the correct answer, but they want to conform with the majority of people around them. So when everybody says that, I don't know, the third line corresponds to the first line, they're going to say that as well. Or actually a lot of people are going to do that because they want to confirm, conform, conform to that. Another thing where you see that, uh, where you, where you see social influence happening as well is uh, in the context of obedience. Yeah. Uh, maybe you heard about maybe you heard about the famous uh, uh, Milgram prison experiments, right? Where they kind of put people in different groups. They said, "Okay, now guys, for for two weeks, some of you are going to play the prisoners, some other ones of you are going to play uh, the guards." And then they completely got into it. They completely got absorbed by it, and they kind of uh, were completely obedient and got into these roles uh, because sort of the, the framing sort of su suggested it. So social influence is, is really, really prevalent. You know, we are social creatures. So uh, we, are, we are affected by what's happening around us in, in our world, and sometimes even at the very uh, local, local level around us. So how can we define social influence? Well, we can define it as change in an individual's thoughts, feelings, attitudes, or behaviors that result from interaction with another individual or a group. We had it last time. You now we looked at this paper of uh, these colleagues of mine when I was in, in, in Switzerland who kind of had studied the wisdom of the crowds and they had shown that as soon as people start talking with each other about these kind of questions that they had, you know, about, I don't know, what is the border length between Switzerland and Italy or how many... Um, how many um, rapes are there uh, in Switzerland per year? So these kind of questions where nobody really knew the answer. Uh, and as soon as people started to talk about that, started to discuss the things, the wisdom of the crowd effect was undermined. Yeah. So the reason being that then people follow others, but those others might be wrong, right? And by doing so through social influence, in this case, um, the diversity uh, got eroded. So people didn't really... Um, stick to their, their beliefs and to their own, own, own original thoughts anymore. Okay, so what I'm going to do with you now, I'm going to do something that is 
really cool. I'm really excited about this. Uh, let's, let's, I'm really looking forward to this because I'm going to play a little experiment with you guys. Right? I'm going to play an experiment with you about social influence. More precisely, the experiment is going to be, it's going to be about uh, yawning. Yeah? So we're going to look at uh, the social influence of yawning. So please pay attention, please pay attention if you're going to yawn in the next few minutes, right? Because I'm going to ask you a question about this afterwards. Okay, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you a little video. It's around three, four minutes. And then afterwards, please tell me if you had to, well, I see it already, but please tell me if you had to yawn or if you didn't. So I'm going to ask you a question about that. Okay, so let's get this started. Okay, so looking at the audience, I saw a handful of yawns, right? uh, at least a, a few. Um, well, people played this experiment with, with, with many people, many respondents. Uh, the, the normal result, oh, that's another one. Uh, the, the normal result is uh, actually two thirds of people yawn, two thirds of people yawn as a reaction to, to just simply seeing other people, other people yawning. 
And actually, you can you can give this a try. You know, when you are uh, um, somewhere, just yawn in public and have other people uh, look uh, look at the people around you. Right? Uh, you will see that uh, oftentimes, in you know, in half of the cases, it actually works out. Um, people around you are going to start yawning, <coughs> or even just me talking about yawning. Yeah, you know, as, as if I keep saying yawning, yawning. Yawning, yeah. People will yawn, yeah. They are, even if they just show a picture of somebody yawning, yeah. It's uh, it's one of those things uh, which is really, really bizarre, right? And actually, the thing is, we don't really know why that is the case, right? So for a while, um, for a while, people people thought it's about empathy, right? And and there were some studies that showed that uh, when somebody who is close to you um, uh, yawns, you are more likely to yawn. As well, um, actually, they, as I showed some results, you know, with these animals. Remember, there was a little cute little dog who yawned. So when uh, when the when the um, the owner of the dog is yawning, the, the dog is more likely to yawn than when somebody else is yawning. Around. So there was some evidence that it is about empathy, empathy and yawning. Um, but um, but there were also. Um, then some, some recent studies actually showed that uh, it's not that clear. It's not that clear about why people yawn when, when others yawn. And the, the one thing that they found, the one thing that they found is actually, you know, here I have uh, the details of this study, so you can look this up. Yeah, it's actually really some, some, some cool stuff. About why do people yawn? And uh, the one thing that they found as well was that there's sort of a, a clear association with age, with age. So younger people, uh, you guys are more likely to uh, to get influenced by other people yawning around you, and then start uh, yawning yourself. So you see in this graph, you know, the number of yawns on the one axis and the age, the age on the other side. <laughs> Sorry, I think this is funny. Okay, um, so that's yawning. So there's no magic here. There's no magic. It's no magic trick. But uh, we know that yawning, yawning is socially contagious. Yawning is socially contagious, as are a whole bunch of other things that are affected by social influence. For example, we know obesity is contagious. Right? We know crime is contagious. Uh, when people around you are criminals, you're more likely to become a criminal as well. Suicide is unfortunately contagious. Divorce is contagious. Stress, having babies, quitting smoking, and even getting a job is contagious. And these are all things. These are all things. There's no, you know, there's no physical virus or anything. I didn't, I didn't send anything to you, right? So I didn't give you the yawning virus, right? But uh, but you just looked at these pictures of people yawning, and and there you were, and there you had to, you couldn't stop it. You just had to yawn yourself. Huh? So often we are, are, are sort of a whole bunch of people looking at the contagion of non-contagious diseases, for example. Uh, you know, there's, um, there's a study on the spread of autism, yeah, the autism epidemic. Autism, you know, that's a that's a um, it's a disease, uh, but there's no there's no virus spreading here, right? But still, we find that when when um, somebody gets diagnosed with autism, others in that neighborhood also get diagnosed with autism. Right? So there's sort of these um, socially contagious uh, phenomena that are um, really really fascinating, really fascinating. They have a real, real world, real life implication. Okay, so um, why we yawn? Why did you yawn? I don't know. You know that's something for psychologists to find out. Um, or social psychologists, they look more at how does actually, um, uh, why do we get influenced by other people around us? You know, and they look at things like conformity. You know, I remember the little story that I had with the guy at the bus stop. You know? or with uh, compliance, or with uh, obedience. In sociology, and in particular in analytical sociology, you know, we are most interested with two other things. Uh, the first one is how social structures, you know, like social networks, shape social influence. Right? So we are embedded in social contexts, and how does this embeddedment actually uh, affect the way we are influenced by others around us? And the second one is, what are the implications of this social influence? Right? So when, when we get influenced by others, what does it lead to at the end of the day? Right? Okay. 
Now you can think of this in this general schema again, you know, we have the macro micro schema, Coleman's boat. Guys, you can't stop yawning now, the videos and it's not there anymore, right? It's done. Yeah. Um, so uh, we can think of the, the micro macro schema here. We have macro level phenomena and we have uh, uh, micro level entities, you know, individuals that sort of behave in a certain way and they influence each other. And uh, when, we, when we kind of try to understand where social influence comes into play here, and that's sort of what, uh, what the next two studies will be all about that I'm going to talk about is the first, first one is sort of we have social networks on the one side, you know, we are embedded in a social context and then um, uh, how, does this, how does this affect social influence for what people do? And the second one is uh, when we have social influence happening, what does it lead to? And here it's going to lead to inequality and unpredictability at the macro level. So to, uh, to get further into these things, I'm going to talk about two studies that people conducted in, in greater detail. The first one is called the Medical Innovation Study. And it was sort of both of these, as I said, you know, these are landmark studies in, in sociology and in analytical sociology. The first one on medical innovation, there it is about how social networks shape social influence and individual behavior. So how people start adopting a new behavior. In this case, it's the adoption of a new drug, like doctors prescribing a new drug. How do they, how did they, uh, the, uh, how do they get influenced by there are people around them, there are friends, there are acquaintances, and so on, their colleagues. And the second one is then a study on cultural markets, you know, like music, movies, these kind of things. Um, and here, the, the, the point is that social influence leads to macro-level implications. You know, for example, that some movies are just spectacularly successful and others not at all or that some, some, some music is spectacularly successful and, uh, and uh, it brings in a lot of money while others, while or most, of the pe uh, most of the songs or music doesn't. Okay, so let me get into the first one. The first one is this medical innovation study. And as I said, you know, there, are a few, there are a few landmark studies in sociology in general um, and in analytical sociology. This is, this is a landmark study in sociology in general was conducted in the in the 1950s. They wrote a book about this. It's called the medical medical innovations, and uh, they also wrote this this uh, cute little article. You know that that I have the wrong citation here because that would mean the article is over almost 500 pages long. So anyway, uh, it is on Blackboard this article, and uh, the the key for us here is because that was sort of the first the first study where they had a closer look at how networks actually matter. Social networks, how they matter and how they matter for uh, the adoption of a new drug. Okay, so when we put look at this in the, in the macro schema, uh, the first study, this medical innovation study, looks at, looks at this link from the macro to the micro and then to individual behavior, right? So individuals are embedded in their social context, in their social networks, that leads to individuals you know, experiencing their world in a certain way, which then leads to uh, individual behaviors. Okay. Now, so as I, I said, you know, this medical innovation study, it's a landmark study. It was conducted by uh, these three guys at uh, Columbia University at the time. It's James Coleman. It's one of those guys you already came across with before, you know, the guy with the boat. And we had uh, Elihu Katz and Herbert Menzel. They conducted a study on the diffusion of tetracycline. Now that's an antibiotic. Maybe you came across it. You know, GPs, uh, GPs give it away and, uh, um, and prescribe it. Tetracycline was new at the time. It was new at the time in the 1950s. You know, we don't have antibiotics for that long. Actually, you know, it just, just started after the Second World War or during the Second World War uh, when antibiotics got, uh, got, um, got discovered or actually they got discovered before already, but then kind of people started to be able to produce them at a larger scale to help a lot of people to uh, not die yeah? before a lot of people died because of simple bacterial infections that we nowadays would laugh about. Okay, so there was a, a big innovation, right? Antibiotics and they sort of, they developed different kinds of antibiotics, you know, different kinds of antibiotics They help for different sorts of bacteria. And uh, uh, so basically Pfizer, you know, the, the, the medical company, the pharmaceutical company, they, um, they had developed this new drug. And they wanted to know. They wanted to know how um, 
how successful are their marketing efforts, you know, how do doctors start adopting this new drug, which was clearly better than the older drugs, the older antibiotics that were there before. So what they did, you know, they asked these three professors at Columbia University to find out how physicians, you know, medical doctors adopted the new innovation and uh, how mass communication influenced this adoption process. So what did these three guys do? You know, Coleman, Katz, and Menzel. You know, they um, conducted uh, a survey. They conducted a survey to gather uh, accurate and reliable information just at the time when the new drug was released. And the way they went about this, you know, just immediately after this uh, new antibiotic, tetracycline, was released, they interviewed medical doctors in four cities in Illinois. Yeah. And they went, to, they went to all of the doctors, to the general practitioners that were most likely affected by this new drug. Right? So guys who would, who would eventually uh, uh, pick up on the drug and who would prescribe it. So they collected uh, the complete information about 125 doctors and active practices. Yeah. So they, they looked at these doctors and First of all, they interviewed them yeah. in detail. They asked them questions about um, how, how they see their profession, for example, or they looked at, looked at background characteristics of them. But then they also, uh, they also and that was sort of a, a, a cool design at the time, they looked at the prescription records. Right? When did they start prescribing the new drug? Essentially what they did, you know, they had asked these doctors about some stuff, but then they also went to the, to the pharmacies, they went to the pharmacies and asked them nearby and asked them, okay, when did people start handing in prescriptions about this new drug? So that was sort of the, um, the, the design of this study. So, and then they, they uh, could look at the date when a doctor started to prescribe the new drug. Right, so they sort of had a clear starting date when the new drug was, was introduced, it was being available, it was on the market. And then they had um, a date when the, when, the, um, when, when the doctor started to prescribe the new drug. Now for us important, and you know, that's sort of why it's a, such a landmark study, uh, um, uh, especially for analytical sociology, is because they didn't just collect the information about when, when a doctor started to, to uh, prescribe this drug, but they also for the first time, at a large scale, collected information about those doctors' social networks. So they asked them these three different questions, right? They asked, who are your friends among your colleagues? Then they asked for so sort of a friendship relationship. Then they asked, um, with whom do you often discuss your cases? And lastly, to whom do you often turn for advice and information? So these are what we now call network generators because that sort of constructs a, a dyadic data set. Now this kind of constructs information about people being related with each other. And then they can actually map this out, right? And that's sort of, you know, in my, in my, in my daily work, that's sort of what I do a lot, right? I deal with these kind of data. Now with network data, I map them out, I analyze them, I study them. So they looked at um, who do these doctors are friends with? Right? Who are their buddies amongst their colleagues? With whom do they uh, discuss their cases? Right, that's what doctors do. And who do they go for advice? And then they started to combine that. Then they kind of looked at um, their, their, their suggestion was, or their, their idea was, that um, when people get influenced by others, the structures in which they are embedded should matter. Right? Okay, so this is sort of what they found. This is sort of like a, an old plot from this little graph. Yeah, um, uh, when, we, when we add some information to it, um, you know, they had sort of on the one axis, they had then the time. Now, this is sort of the time since the new drug got, uh, got, got, um, got onto the market. And the other axis, they basically had the adoption rate. So how many, how many of those doctors adopted the new drug? And you see, you know, there are three different lines for three different subgroups of the doctors. I come back to that in, in a second. But what you see is that eventually people started to adopt this new drug, right? Some were earlier, others were later. 
But now what they're, but eventually, you know, people, those doctors started to adopt this new drug, prescribe this new drug because it was a better drug, yeah, because it really, it really helped people. But now what, uh, what Coleman, Cutts, and, and, and Menzel did, you know, they looked at different, different subgroups amongst those doctors. And they looked at those, you know, you had, who had uh, no friends amongst their colleagues, that's sort of the line, at, at the, the lowest line. Then they looked at those guys who had one to two friends amongst their colleagues, and then they looked at those who had uh, three or more friends among their colleagues. And what you see immediately, and that's sort of why I included this, this old plot here, you know, uh, because you immediately see that those guys who were more connected, who had more friends amongst their colleagues, they were faster in adopting the new drug. Yeah? They were faster in adopting the new drug. Why those guys who um, were not that well connected amongst their colleagues, in terms of friendship, but also in terms of discussion network and the advice network, those guys adopted the drug at a slower rate. Right? What, can we, what can we take from that? Well, that's actually um, that's something we would observe as a consequence of social influence. When we say that, uh, um, so the finding you know, here was that doctors who were mentioned by their colleagues as friend, advisor, or discussion partner prescribed the new drug on average earlier than those who were named by few or none of their colleagues. What it meant was that networks mattered more, well, actually what it meant was that um, networks seemed to matter for people adopting the new drug. Right? Imagine when somebody is, is, is highly embedded in that and there is influence happening, well, there's higher chances for you to, to be exposed to social influence. So that's sort of why uh, if you are in the middle of things uh, and there is social influence, you should be affected earlier by it, on average. Okay, they also found uh, three other things. First of all, they observed that networks mattered more at the beginning of the adoption phase. Uh, at the beginning, and that's, uh, um, you could think there's uh, uncertainty, we don't really know yet, is this new drug going to work? So uh, their contribution here was to show that these networks relationships, they mattered more at the beginning of the adoption phase. They also showed that different kinds of network ties mattered at different points in time. You know, at the beginning it was discussion and advice, and later on it was the, the friendship network. And they also showed, that was then an, uh, a follow-up, sorry, uh, that um, the network ties mattered more in uncertain situations. Seems to make sense. Yeah? If, you don't know, if you don't know what to do, what are you going to do? You're going to ask your friends around you, in a way. Right. Maybe they have more information about that. Right? Uh, maybe they already made some experience with that. But the key point for us here really is that this is an example how we have the network structures at the top, right? that's sort of how people are embedded in their social context, how that affects how individuals experience their world around them, you know, that sort of changes their values, which ultimately leads to individual behavior. So in this case, you know, we had these medical doctors being embedded in in the network of colleagues, right? And then uh, this affected their their values or what they thought about um, uh, this particular drug, right? And the structure here mattered a great deal, mattered a great deal, because uh, when they were exposed to more other doctors or when they had more other doctors among their friends, you know, obviously they sort of had had more were more in touch with others who could have potentially already adopted it. So they, they while if they were isolated or they did had only fewer friends among their colleagues, they were not exposed to many other adopters at the early stages. Right? And that then eventually leads to the adoption of individual behavior. Okay, so that's sort of the first study I wanted to go into, into depth with you uh, that looks at how um, um, social influence works and how network structures matter a great deal for social influence. Okay, I have a second study. I have a second study that's uh, the cultural market studies. Here is one, um, one uh, reference, you know, that's the one which was the required reading for today. There are also a bunch of other papers, you know, they wrote a series of papers um, published in Science actually, uh, where they looked at the implications of social influence. Okay, so now we're talking about, we'll come back to that later on, at the link of, okay, uh, individuals behave in a certain way, and then they influence each other. What does it mean for the macro-level outcomes that, that we observe? 
Okay, so you know it's, it's, it's associated with these guys with uh, Matt Salganik, this really cool guy, Duncan Watts, one of my heroes, um, Peter Dotz. One of the things that uh, that they observed was that when you look at cultural markets, cultural markets now I'm meaning um, books, movies, um, theater plays, uh, music, these kind of things, right? Uh, it's incredibly hard, it's incredibly hard to uh, predict success. It's incredibly hard. Um, for example, when we look at the Harry Potter books, you, know, you remember this stuff that you read when you were little, um, this kind of stuff. Um, they were rejected by publishing houses eight times you know, when the author went to, to find a publishing house, it was rejected eight times, eight times, and eventually, you know, the, these books were sold over 300 million times. It's a huge success, you know, uh, 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 Rowling became a millionaire, uh, she just made it, uh, it was a huge success, well actually, it was rejected eight times, and, uh, but it was incredibly difficult to predict. Yeah. The same thing actually holds for most movies as well. Sometimes you wonder, how could they have ever produced such a bullshit movie? Yeah, you watch a movie and think, God, that's just so ridiculous. Yeah? Why didn't anybody pick up on it? Yeah? They, they spent millions of millions of dollars, of euros and whatnot, and then they produced really bad films. Why, why do they do that? But the thing is, it's really incredibly hard to predict the success of movies. It's sometimes like a, like a hit or, or nothing. It's really, um, um, you know, insiders of the industry, say, they say that uh, um, people, don't really, people don't really know anything. Yeah? It's like a guessing game. It's like a, like a, big, a big gamble. Yeah? Or um, the other thing, you know, um, the American Idol TV show uh, in the States, it now goes into its 15th season. After that, it's done, and it's good that it's done, finally. Uh, but, uh, and this show attracted millions, millions of viewers, you know, for years, it was sort of a huge thing. But when they, when they first started to produce this show, it was rejected by, um, by three television networks. They said, it's not going to work, it's going to be no success, don't even try. At the end, it became a huge success. Yeah? So how can these things happen that sometimes we are just so completely, completely off and there's sort of this huge, huge difference between some, some, some things in, in the cultural sphere and cultural markets being incredibly successful, and others not at all. And another, a last example that I have, you know, it's sort of the Star Wars movies. I don't have to tell you about it. You know, it's a big thing. Yeah? Um, it's huge. Yeah? But when it first, uh, when it first, you know, for the first movie back in the 1970s when they produced it, the insiders at Fox, you know, who kind of were, were involved in the production, they said, uh, most of them thought it's going to be an all but certain flop. Uh, it's going to be a huge waste of money. Uh, people thought, most of the people thought it's going to be a flop right up until the day of, of its release, and you all know what happened. Right? So it became, it became uh, movie theater history. So there's a huge unpredict unpredictability in these kind of things, and sometimes we have no idea where we are going. So unpredictability in cultural markets, insiders say nobody knows anything, it's a huge gamble, and so on. Finally, it's even off sometimes like that in the academic business. Uh, you have some folks writing, you know, I told you we write articles, we write books and stuff. But sometimes, you know, some, some of your articles or books become popular and you never thought about it. Yeah? So you thought, this is, not, this is not my best paper, but it becomes extremely popular. And then others see it and then it becomes even more popular and so on. And that's actually already the logic, that's already the logic that those guys, uh, you know, Matt Saganik, um, Peter Dodds and Duncan Watts, uh, uh, came up with or, or, or applied in the context of cultural markets. So they thought that maybe, maybe it's because of social influence. Maybe it's because of social influence. We will talk more about cumulative advantage, you know, the Matthew effect next, next week, so this will stay with us a little bit. But they said maybe social influence leads to cumulative advantage where those who are seen as successful become even more successful. How can that work? Well, think about exposure, for example, right? So um, you walk into a bookstore and there are just thousands of books, you have no clue. Where do you go? You go to the bestseller list, you look at them, and then you, you look at maybe the first 20 books, you browse them, but through simple exposure, through simple exposure, you already looked at, at successful ones and not at the ones that, um, that 
might be equally good, but they were not on display, for example. Right? So there's sort of this exposure thing, or people start talking about, about something. A song becomes popular, the media write about it, and then it just goes nuts, it explodes, people start twittering about it or whatnot, right? They write Facebook comments about it and so on, and then you become aware of it. So that's sort of this cumulative advantage idea that we will talk more about, uh, which is um, very prevalent, which can actually lead to a lot of inequality. So here, you know, the idea was that maybe social influence leads to this cumulative advantage, which then in turn leads to more inequality in, in the ratings of, of cultural goods, right, of, of whatever that is. You know, actually, they looked at music. And it should also lead to um, unpredictability. Right? That was sort of the idea that they had. And why I'm, I'm introducing this study here is because it was really, really clever. So the, the, uh, the, they did, they created what they called the music lab, music lab, which was essentially an, you know, uh, an art, a, a website that they set up. They created an artificial cultural market. They created a website, you know, they attracted people to go to this website, and on this website, people could, um, participants could listen to, rate, and download songs for free by unknown artists, unknown bands. So nobody knew these bands, but they put them up there, you know, and some of them were good, others were bad, you know, but, that just, but that's not the point of the study here. People could go to this site. They had over 16,000 people participating in that. And then the key here was, the key here was that uh, um, Salganik and others, they controlled the information that the people that went to this website received about this music. And in particular, the, what, the, what, the, what the key core element here was, uh, the, the treatment in the experimental design was, do people hear about what others liked? That's sort of the key thing. So um, the design was, and that sort of was very straightforward, you know, first of all, you know, people went to this website, they could listen to the music, and then at the end, they had to uh, rate the music. Now, did they like it or did they not like it? And then they had this experimental design, and you know, I, I like this kind of stuff because it's really neat and straightforward and, and very clear. And here you see how they, how they actually did this, you know, to study a social phenomenon like social influence. So instead of just having everybody, after listening to the music, go and rate on the music, they basically diverted half of their people to what they call the social influence condition. And in this social influence condition, people received information about what others liked. Right? It's like basically they, they, they represented this, the, the, the songs you know, or the music that they could listen to in different ways. In the first one, it's sort of what we call the control condition or the independent condition. They were just given this information without any further information. That's just the name of the song, the, the band, and uh, they could listen to it and download it. Yeah? But then for the other people, for the other people, they got the name of the song, uh, the, the name of the band, but also the ratings that this song had already received by others. That's kind of this idea, you go on Amazon and you see three, four, five stars and so on. That's exactly the kind of information that they then gave to the participants. And then they looked at uh, how do these groups differ in their eventual reading of the, of the song, right? If social influence would not matter, you would think, and, and, you, and, and, and all that would matter is the quality of the song, these two groups should not differ in their ratings at the end of the day. But what they found, and now I'm prefacing that, that it mattered hugely. In fact, they even did these funny experiments, but we'll talk more about that on, uh, on Thursday, where they kind of flipped the ratings around. Right? So, so they had some songs um, that were highly rated. They were given five stars, and others were given one star. And then they kind of introduced this condition where they flipped it around. So artificially, they changed it so that the one that was highly rated suddenly only had one star, and the one that was lowly rated got five stars. And what you saw is that then the ratings completely took off into the other direction. So that then people started to rate the ones that they thought that others liked, although nobody liked it, they started to rate it extremely high. While the song that, uh, that, um, that people liked, but then they kind of got this information that others didn't like it, then they started to rate it low as well. Right, so that's sort of the thing that we're going to talk about on, on Thursday. And that's sort of the Matthew effect or success breeds success or these kind of things. We, we come back to, to these kind of uh, dynamics, which is an incredibly cool design. So anyway, what they also did, what they also did, you know, one of the problems that we have in, in, in society often is that when we study it, there's just one world. 
right? That's just one society and we study that. What they did, what you can do in these artificial settings when you create an, uh, an, an artificial setting like that, they created different worlds. Remember, one of the suggestions was that it was also related to, unpredict uh, to the predictability of, 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 of how, um, how, how accurate are you in predicting that one storm is going to be uh, the highest rated one or the lowest rated one, right? The idea here is when social influence matters, so you get influenced by others. At the beginning, you get influenced for whatever stupid reasons, right? Somebody likes a song or sees it or whatnot, but then as soon as social influence kicks in, and if you buy into this argument of social influence, these things sort of lift off, right? They lift off and then a song that was maybe only a little bit high, higher rated than the other one because it was placed first and the other one was, was, rate, uh, was placed last, then it's sort of hard, to, hard to, take, uh, to, to flip that around again. So what they did, they also basically created different worlds. So people were not just sent to the, to the, uh, to the social influence condition, but they were sent to different, to different groups of social influence conditions. So they had their 16,000 participants and, and some of them basically uh, got the information about what another thousand said, what another thousand said. So split up in different groups, right? And that's sort of how they did it. So here you see, okay, so they had the independent condition and then they had the social influence condition where people were sent into different worlds. Okay, and then they did this, um, they did this, uh, basically they did two experiments, well, they did some more, but I'm going to talk about two experiments here. For the social influence conditions, in the first one, they remember now we are in this setting where people get the information about what others thought about the song. Right? So now in the first experiment, they basically gave them the website and there the songs were in random order. There was no sorting by it, but there was a reading of the songs next to it. But there was no sorting to it. When you think about it, well, you could say this is the weak social influence condition. So people get information about what others thought, but it's not, it's not ranked like that. Right? While in the second experiment, they also ranked the songs according to what the others liked. Right? So the song that was rated highest was also displayed at the top. It's like this bestseller list of songs, like these charts that they, that they then gave their, their participants. And one of the things that they found was that um, uh, the songs, the songs that were rated highest, and now this is sort of uh, here at the, at, the, at the lower axis displayed, you know, the sort of the, the, the rank market share, which one was at the, at the top at the end and which one got the lowest rating at the end of the day. And uh, what, they, what they could show is that um, the people started to listen more to songs that others had rated highly. Right? And now the key here is you see sort of these gray dots and these uh, and these these white dots. These white dots are the independent conditions, right? Where they didn't give people they didn't give people this additional information about what others liked, right? But they still had the information about who liked what, right? So then, if you would say it's all about the actual song, then the songs that um, that uh, uh, that were, uh, were, were were actually good, they they should be they should be listened to a lot as well. But here they found clear evidence, you see these things take off, that, uh, that people started to listen more to, to songs when others had already rated them high. Okay, they looked at some other stuff as well. Here they looked at um, the inequality. Yeah? With inequality we mean how, how unequally distributed are these ratings? Yeah? Is there sort of one, one superstar and one that is really bad? Yeah? Or is everybody sort of in the middle? Yeah? If everybody would have sort of the same rating, inequality would be low. While if you have some guys who score really high and others that score really low, then inequality is high. Right? And uh, maybe you guys came across that. We measure that straightforwardly with the Gini coefficient. That's sort of just a measure for, for this idea of inequality. Yeah? How unequally distributed are certain things in the population. Now what you see here is, you know, again, they have their social influence conditions and now they have these eight different worlds that they, that they looked at. And you see the independent uh, condition. And you see now that the inequality in those ratings was really higher when there was social influence compared to the independent condition when there was no social influence. And furthermore, you know, they also show nicely that the, that the strength of the social influence also matters. And at the top we have the weak social influence condition, while at the bottom we have the strong social influence condition, you know, where they also told people about... Um, where they also ranked and, and sorted the songs according to the ratings. And you see that in the lower part, you know, this inequality was, was much higher. 
Okay, uh, a last thing that they found was that uh, the unpredictabil uh, unpredictability increased as well. What is unpredictab unpredictability? Well, unpredictability because they had this information about the independent, so about the independent condition. So how many times would people listen to a song? Uh, how much did they like it when they got no social influence, uh, when they got no uh, um, additional information about this song? Right? And then they looked at how much does, do these things overlap with the things that are observed in the social influence conditions. And there they found that, okay, it's not just the inequality that goes up yeah, in terms of, of the ratings, but also the unpredictability. So in sum, you know, what they had found was that social influence at the micro level, social influence at the micro level leads to inequality and unpredictability at the macro level. Now we're talking about songs here, but these things can lead to, to much other things, you know, like, like wealth and there's these studies, you know, I don't know, maybe you read Piquet here about uh, uh, inequality of wealth distributions, that those who are already rich get even richer and things like that. So it has some real world implications. So anyway, when we put this back into the, into the Coleman boat, where we are, where do we stand? Well, now we kind of looked at the implications of social influence. Yeah? So people hear about others, which sort of changes their values and then ultimately their individual behavior and then individuals behave in a certain way and then they influence others, which ultimately leads to uh, the inequality or the in, in unpredictability. Okay, so that social influence, we will talk more about that uh, actually uh, on Thursday and even on Tuesday. You know, on, on Thursday, we will talk more about what is called self-fulfilling prophecies, where things are not true, but everybody believes in it and then they become true. And uh, next week, we'll talk more about the success breed success dynamics, which is called uh, the Matthew effect or Gibraltar's principle, or, or yeah, it has some other names. Right? So the reading for Thursday, self-fulfilling prophecies, it's on Blackboard. Thanks very much, guys. Nice.